This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. Well, I watch your interview because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. I did no due diligence. Told I have me. something I'd like to sell. <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world. Is that right? One of the president's closest advisors is Jake Sullivan. He was the national security advisor and the second youngest person to hold that job at the age of 43. I sat down with him recently here in the executive office building to discuss a wide range of international issues and national security issues affecting the president and our country. So let me get right to the heart of Ukraine, if I could ask you. Is there any chance of a resolution in Ukraine matter anytime in the foreseeable future? Any possibility of a truce? or some kind of agreement that you think could end this war uh, in the next few months or so? You never say never. There's always a chance. And we've been clear from the beginning that we would support a diplomatic solution that uh, vindicated Ukraine's right to sovereignty and territorial integrity. But the odds of it in the next few months, I think, are quite low. On China, the President of the United States has not met with Xi Jinping for COVID-related reasons. But there is a possibility they might meet in the upcoming G20 meeting. Do you have any plans to have an uh, um, agreement or any kind of pr proposed uh, settlements of any issues that are now ongoing between the two countries? Or is it just more, more or less a meet and greet with no advanced planning of any great consequence? Well, right now, there's no meeting planned. Uh, but as you say, they will both be in Bali, Indonesia, for the G20 in November. And it would afford an opportunity for the two of them to sit down in person. Actually, Despite the fact that they've spent a huge amount of time together when Joe Biden was vice president, they've not met in person since President Biden became president. And that's because Xi Jinping has basically not left China in two years due to COVID-19. So this would be their first real chance to sit face to face and talk through the full range of issues in the relationship. I wouldn't expect major agreements to come out of that. But if they do actually sit, uh, and again, that's hasn't been decided, um, I would expect that we would see some progress on some issues where the two countries' interests do align. As we talk today, it's come out that uh, President Putin will be meeting with President Xi Jinping, most likely somewhere in uh, Europe uh, not too long from now. Uh, was that a surprise to you? And what do you think they're going to be talking about? Well, it's not a surprise. Uh, President Xi and President Putin have met frequently uh, over the course of each of their tenure. And in fact, President Putin went to Beijing earlier this year and met in person with President Xi in February when they rolled out this new partnership between the two countries. So I think that they'll talk about the full range of issues in their relationship. But I, I would note two things. First, before President Xi goes to Uzbekistan to meet with President uh, Putin on the sidelines of another summit, he's going to Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan's a place where actually China and Russia compete for influence. So it's an indication that this is a relationship not without its complications. And then second, China has actually stood back from fully getting in behind the Russians when it comes to their war in Ukraine. We have not seen them provide large scale support in terms of weapons uh, or industrial scale efforts to undermine Western sanctions. So uh, from our perspective, this relationship is something that bears close watching, but again, is not without its complications. As we talk, there are also reports that North Korea is selling uh, weapons to Russia. Was that a surprise to the administration? Well, what it indicates, actually, is that Russia doesn't have a lot of options. Uh, it appears to be running short of its own munitions. It looks around the world and doesn't find a lot of countries willing to sell it munitions. So it has to look to states like Iran and North Korea to get ammunition and other forms of uh, weaponry to be able to sustain its conflict in Ukraine. This is not, in our view, uh, a demonstration of strength by Russia. Now, the negotiations with Iran to restore, if that's the right verb, the uh, nuclear agreement is ongoing. It's been going going for quite some time. Do you see any resolution of that in the near future? And not in the coming days. Uh, the Iranians have come back with a set of counter proposals, uh, which we are still taking a look at. But it doesn't suggest that an agreement is uh, imminent um, right away. That being said, we do believe that there still is 
a pathway to a compliance for compliance return to the JCPOA. We will continue to work on that with our partners, particularly our European partners. And if Iran is prepared to do its part to get back into the JCPOA, we stand ready to do so. And as we talk, the new prime minister of UK has been announced, uh, previously involved in foreign policy. Uh, have you met her before? I have met her before. I've met her here in the White House, right down the hall from where we are right now, when she was foreign secretary. Uh, she's transitioned from being essentially their secretary of state uh, to being their prime minister. And actually, just yesterday, President Biden had the opportunity to have uh, a long phone call with her just hours after she had assumed her new position. And do you expect any change in the UK-US policy as a result of her becoming prime minister? At a foundational level, no. Uh, you know, this is a special relationship. The two of them reaffirmed their commitment to the strength and vitality of the U.S.-U.K. alliance. And I think on all of the major issues, whether it's Russia or China or Iran, you'll see the same kind of um, deep consultation and engagement between the two countries that you've seen before, regardless of who's president, regardless of who's prime minister. Uh, so I don't expect that there will be uh, any fundamental changes in the relationship. But, you know, there'll be issues that we have to work through, of course, uh, as there always are. Now, as we talk, the UN uh, General Assembly will be meeting not too long from now in New York, as it does every year. Um, do you think the UN has still uh, a useful purpose in diplomacy? Because it doesn't seem to be able to solve any problems, ongoing war problems that we now see in US or Ukraine or Russia. What do you think is the UN's main purpose at this point? Well, the UN actually has proved its continued uh, effectiveness in actually being able to bring about diplomatic agreements in very difficult circumstances. I'll give you just two examples from the past few months. First, on Russia, Ukraine, it was the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who played a central role in getting a deal between Russia and Ukraine for the export of grain from both Ukrainian ports and Russian ports in the Black Sea. That's helping the entire world with respect to lowering food prices and expanding access to foodstuffs uh, at a critical moment. Second, uh, it was a UN mediator working with our US envoy, the Saudis, Emiratis, uh, and the Yemenis, who helped produce earlier this year a ceasefire in the war in Yemen, which had been the worst humanitarian catastrophe in the world. That ceasefire is now going on six months the longest period of peace in seven years in Yemen, and the UN played a key role in that. So it is not without its difficulties and complications. It is a big bureaucracy in need of constant reform, but the UN is still there on key issues in diplomacy, in delivering on global health, global food security, and other issues. And all of that will be on display in New York in two weeks. Now, recently, the president made a major speech on democracy. But while the threat to American democracy is real, I want to say as clearly as we can, we are not powerless in the face of these threats. And in it, he talked about the values of democracy, which is a large part of our foreign policy, which is to promote democracy around the world. Um, are events in the United States over the last year or so making it more difficult for the U.S. to say to other countries, look at how wonderful our democracy has worked, and therefore you should be following some of the things we do? Well, it does require a degree of humility. I mean, the United States does need to acknowledge that we have our own difficulties and challenges within our own democracy, even as we tout and promote democratic institutions, rule of law, human rights around the world. But I think President Biden is actually a very good messenger for that, someone who can speak honestly and clearly to the American people about the strains in our democracy, and then someone who can speak honestly and clearly to the world about how, despite all of its imperfections, democracy remains the best form of government for delivering for citizens and for promoting human dignity. a moment about your own background. You are not generally out there promoting your background. It's quite impressive, and I just want to let people know about it a bit. You grew up in Minnesota? That's right. And I guess you were a superstar in elementary school, junior high school, high school. You were president of your class, president of student government. Is there anything you failed to do in high school that you wanted to do? Well, I uh, didn't win all the cross-country races that I wanted to win, I guess. 
Yeah. But you went to Yale. Yeah. And at Yale, you must have done reasonably well. You were elected as a Rhodes Scholar. And from uh, Oxford, you later came back and went to Yale Law School. And you were a top editor there and became a Supreme Court clerk for Justice Breyer. So did you, when you're having this career, did you ever think that uh, you could make a mistake or your career could kind of go off the deep end or something because everything was working out perfectly? Well, it's true that I have had these incredible opportunities, but at every one of those stages, I went through the same fears and growing pains and slip ups and stumbles that everybody did. And, you know, that was true with respect to uh, academic work that was far from perfect. It was true with respect to relationships that didn't work out. It, you know, it's, I, I had what I think was a, you know, an incredibly lucky childhood and upbringing, but one that was not too different from the way a lot of other people who grew up in the Midwest in the 1980s and, and then, you know, got to have these chances. Your father and mother, what did they do? So my father uh, worked on the business side of the Minneapolis Star Tribune, which was the major newspaper in Minneapolis. Uh, my mother was a teacher and a guidance counselor in the Minneapolis public schools. And uh, I'm one of five, I'm the second of five kids. And we all went to uh, the Minneapolis public schools, graduated from Southwest High School. And your siblings, uh, do they say, look, you're too good, you're a Rhodes Scholar, you're a Yale Law Journal and everything, or there are no sibling rivalries? I mean, actually, I would say my sister is probably the most impressive among us. She's a pediatrician. She was a two-sport Division I athlete, and um, she's got five kids uh, and is currently working at the Department of Health and Human Services on COVID-19 and other um, pandemic responses. So um, I'm like kind of middle of the pack in terms of my siblings. Well, there was another person who was a Rhodes Scholar who went to Yale Law School uh, who became President of the United States, Bill Clinton. So have you ever thought of running for office yourself? I used to think about it. Uh, but honestly, over the course of the years, I think my skills are better suited to public service in a non-elected format. Um, and uh, I'd rather help other people who I think would be better suited for actually running for office themselves. Let's talk for a moment about what it's like to be the National Security Advisor the National Security Advisor Office was set up, I think, in the Eisenhower administration, more or less, though President Truman had a National Security Advisor as well. Your job is to get in early every day, make sure there's no crisis, or if there is a crisis, tell the president. Are you seeing the president early in the morning and briefing him? Is that what you do, as, as many have done before? Yes, yeah, so in the morning, we have something called the President's Daily Brief. Uh, that takes place in the Oval Office. And uh, it's myself, uh, my two deputies, and then the Director of National Intelligence, uh, who are there every day. And then we also bring in other cabinet members depending on what the subjects are being briefed so that he gets, the president gets exposure to his full national security team over the course of the week. And we talk to him about things that have developed overnight uh, around the world. And we also talk to him about longer term trends that he uh, expresses interest in and wants to stay on top of. So it's a mix of both the immediate term and the long term and it gives him a full picture of the challenges and opportunities in the world for American foreign And then policy. during a typical day, do you see him a couple other times, or do you see him at the end of the day as well? Well, you know, just to take yesterday as an example, uh, in addition to the PDB, uh, Secretary Blinken and I had the opportunity to just sit with him informally uh, for a little while before the cabinet meeting uh, so we could talk through a kind of tick list of issues that had been building up over the course of the last couple of weeks. And then... Later in the afternoon, we had this call with the British Prime Minister, and, and that involved some amount of time to talk through what he wanted to accomplish in that phone call, what uh, we expected she would say to him, and then I sat there with him while he did the phone call. So that would be a typical day, seeing the president two, three times, and then spending time with the other principals of the National Security Council, the, the cabinet secretary, secretary of defense, the secretary of uh, the treasury, the secretary of state, uh, and talking through the big decisions that we would need to tee up for the president to make on everything from global food security to Taiwan to the CHIPS Act, uh, you know, the, the new law that's been passed to invest in advanced microchips here in the United States. We cover the waterfront. So sometimes presidents, I observe, lose their temper and they yell. Um, is President Biden a yeller when he's not happy or he just calmly just says, here's what I think? He's not a yeller. Uh, it, you know, he's somebody who is disciplined and direct and holds us to a high standard. And he will challenge us to make sure that we have 
nailed down the details of everything we are presenting to him. And if we haven't, he'll tell us, do better. Uh, but he does so in a totally respectful, straightforward way, the same way that everybody has seen him in public life. So when I worked in the White House under President Carter, there were frequent disputes between the Secretary of State, Cy Vance, and the National Security Advisor, the big Brzezinski. And it's a great tradition, it seems, in our government that the Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor are always sparring one way or the other, leaking to the press. In this administration, I haven't seen a lot of leaks from your office or the Secretary's office uh, criticizing the other person's office. So how have you avoided that problem? Well, a lot of it has to do with just deep mutual respect and straight up friendship uh, between myself and the Secretary of State. Tony and I have known each other for years. Uh, we're good friends. Our families are friends. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't debates. We don't have disputes because we, we have a, an open operating style. I think we both try to be nice people, uh, but we do have debates. We disagree on certain issues. And the thing that I take very seriously is my responsibility to run a process that is open, humane, fair, transparent, uh, and above board. And I try to do that so that his perspective, the Secretary of Defense's perspective, the Attorney General's perspective, depending on the issue, are all teed up to the president in a way in which uh, they get their say. And then we work it out. And that has, in my view, worked quite effectively over the course of the past 19 months. And I consider it one of the central uh, responsibilities of my position to ensure that that process is fair and effective. In hindsight, which is always 2020, is there anything the administration could have done to prevent Putin from invading? Six months into this invasion, I'm fairly well convinced that Putin was gonna do this no matter what. So let's go around the world for a couple of trouble spots. Uh, North Korea, um, any progress on getting them to give up their nuclear testing or is that difficult to do? It's difficult, obviously, through multiple presidents going back to the Clinton administration. Uh, the North Koreans have continued to move forward with their nuclear weapons program. In the course of the past year, they have conducted a number of long-range missile tests. We have been warning about the possibility of a seventh nuclear test, test of a nuclear weapon, and we still think that that is something that is likely to happen in the coming months. We have also indicated to the North Koreans that we are prepared to sit down in a serious way to conduct diplomacy, to, on a step-by-step -step basis, uh, work towards the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So far, the North Koreans have evinced no interest in that. China and Taiwan. There's been a lot of rhetoric from the U.S. side, a lot of rhetoric from the Chinese side. Do you envision any real problem occurring where the Chinese might actually invade Taiwan? I think it remains a distinct threat uh, that there could be a military contingency around Taiwan. And uh, the People's Republic of China has actually stated as official policy that it is not taking the invasion of Taiwan off the table, that that remains one of the potential options for the reunification of Taiwan. Their position has been changing over time in terms of their disturbance of the status quo across the Taiwan Strait, actions that they are taking with their military to undermine peace and stability. The American position has remained steadfast and consistent. One China Policy, Taiwan Relations Act, three joint communiques that we agreed with China back in the 1970s and 80s that laid out uh, that from our perspective, there should be no unilateral changes to the status quo across the Taiwan Strait. We continue to believe that, and we will continue to push back against any effort uh, to change the status quo by force. Now, there is legislation now moving forward through Congress to kind of toughen up the existing uh, support the U.S. has for Taiwan. Has the administration adopted a position on that legislation yet? Well, I'm actually going to have the opportunity later today, literally later today, to go up to the Hill to talk to some members about this legislation. I'd prefer to have the opportunity to lay it out for them before okay. I lay it out on TV. But I will just say this. There are elements of that legislation with respect to how we can strengthen our security assistance for Taiwan that are quite uh, effective and robust that will improve Taiwan's security. There are other elements that give us some concern. Let's go back to Ukraine for a moment. In hindsight, which is always 2020, is there anything the administration could have done to prevent Putin from invading or told the allies more forcefully that this invasion was going to occur to convince them? Because it seemed as if they didn't really believe it was going to happen. 
What would you have done, or would you think you should have done in hindsight, if anything, differently than you did? Given that we're still in the middle of this unfolding crisis, it's hard to get the kind of level of perspective to look back and say, hey, maybe we could have done this instead of that. There is always something you could improve upon. I would never say, no, 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 we did everything absolutely perfectly. But six months into this invasion, I'm fairly well convinced that Putin was going to do this no matter what, that he considered this central to his legacy as president of Russia and he was not going to be knocked off course. The only thing that was going to stop him was the physical might of the Ukrainian forces holding back his ability to take Kyiv and take other major cities, backed by the weapons that we provided them. Uh, that was the strategy we executed. I think we executed it well, and I think Ukraine is in a position now, today, to ensure that they will remain a strong, sovereign, viable, independent state even as they continue to try to resist Russian aggression on a portion of their territory. In terms of the allies, um, you know, we took unprecedented measures, uh, quite novel measures, to declassify information, to make presentations both to our allies and to the international community. And I think over time that actually did build a sense of unity that continues to this day. An allied unity, transatlantic unity, has been a huge thorn in the side for Vladimir Putin as he's tried to uh, to break that and try to, to produce a weaker, less cohesive NATO when in fact what he's gotten is the exact opposite. So what you're referring to, I think, is that to my surprise when I was reading the New York Times about this was going on, uh, information that seemed like it was vital uh, information was declassified and in effect given to the press about the troop movements of, of the Russians. Was that a complicated decision to come to? controversial within the administration to say we're going to declassify and leak our best intelligence about what the Russians are doing? It, it definitely took a whole process of us thinking about all of the risks and benefits of doing that, especially since it was uncharted territory. And that involved me sitting with our intelligence professionals, uh, our diplomats, and ultimately with the president to uh, bless a strategy that would involve the systematic declassification of information so that no one would be surprised and so that Russia could not try to generate pretexts for what it was doing. And I think it turned out to be uh, an effective method of putting Russia on the back foot, putting the Western alliance on the front foot, and giving us the opportunity to build a coalition that is currently supporting Ukraine. So as I said earlier, hindsight's always 2020. In hindsight, would you have um, exited Afghanistan differently than the way you did it? Well, at the end of the day, um, any time you have a circumstance where you're ending a 20-year war with 20 years of decisions and mistakes that have piled up through multiple administrations, the exit would not be easy. There was no clean, easy exit. And I think the strategic decision to go, to end that war after 20 years, was absolutely the correct decision. Were there things that we could have done differently? I think the answer to that is always yes. And there will be time uh, as I end up looking back and reflecting on that period to pinpoint what some of those might have been. But from my perspective, the underlying decision to end the war in Afghanistan, which the president took, I think, in a quite courageous way, was the correct decision. And one year later, to me, um, it, it is more, the time that has passed has only reinforced the correctness of that decision. Many people who held your job have a burnout after a few years. Um, you look like you're in good shape and you're young. You're the second youngest person to ever have this job. So you anticipate doing this for an entire four-year period of this uh, first term, if it was another term, but let's say this four-year period of time? Well, I serve at the pleasure of the president, but uh, I feel passionate about the work that I'm doing. I feel blessed to be part of this team. I feel blessed to be able to serve President Biden, and I'd like to keep doing it.